How's everybody doing tonight? Glad to have you with us. <laughs> I see Irish Shy Town is, uh, I mean, maybe we should just call him Salty right off the bat. Thanks for being patient uh, to those who've been waiting in the YouTube live. We, we had a major computer issue going on, and that's why we're a few minutes behind getting started tonight. And Jesse, Jesse is juggling his equipment. How you doing there, Jesse? I'm doing well. I'm just hopeful that everyone can hear me. It sounded like I was having a lot of technical difficulties early on. So as long as everyone can hear me, that's really all I care about. Well, we can hear you. We can hear you. <laughs> Perfect then. Good old, yeah. So here we, you know, we're ready to go. IB Nation Sports Talk up and running. Glad to have you with us. We are four days away from Notre Dame and Ohio State as we start this show. Once again, a lot of stuff to get to. On this show, we've got uh, a lot on Notre Dame and Ohio State, of course. Uh, and as we start the show, as always, like, subscribe, rate, review, all that good stuff. We appreciate it. It helps us out. It helps us uh, get to more uh, listeners and viewers. I tell you what, uh, the Irish Breakdown podcast channel right now is blowing up. I had a big day yesterday with all the different shows that we've got going on. Tomorrow is going to be midweek mailbag. Vince and I will be here to do the mailbag, taking on all kinds of questions. So we will be doing that Thursday. I've got a reporter from Ohio State who'll be joining me that uh, I'll be talking to, get his take on the Buckeyes and you know all that kind of good stuff. And of course, Saturday, 10 a.m., Vince and I and Brian as well will be joining in again with uh, the new IB countdown to kickoffs. We've got all that going on. Before we get to Notre Dame and Ohio State, though, Jesse, some uh, some bad news for a couple of former Notre Dame football players, uh, starting with Ian Book, cut by the New Orleans Saints this afternoon. And, of course, they've got Jameis Winston starting, and they brought in Andy Dalton. So Book became the odd man out, and I guess they hope to sign him to the practice squad potentially. I mean, that's, that's, I think what they always say, you know, they hope to sign him to the practice squad, but uh, yeah, Jesse Vigo pointing out Jesse's mustache. You almost have the Ian book mustache going on today. Yeah, I got, uh, I got a brand new look. Uh, I got rid of the glasses. My contacts finally came in. Uh, I've been without contacts for like eight months. I never wear my glasses. So eight months of glasses was brutal. Um, and then, yeah, I shaved, shaved it all off and then kept my little mustache I got going here. I think it's my best look. So I appreciate you calling out Sweet. how good the mustache looks. <laughs> yep. So Book, of course, drafted in the fourth round last year. He played just one game. It was an ugly game. Did, did, did you see that Saints-Dolphins game he played in last year? One of the uglier NFL football games <laughs> I've seen in a while. Yeah, it wasn't good. I think uh, at the time wasn't uh, wasn't too a hurt as well. So it was kind of the battle of some backup think so. quarterbacks going on. So uh, yeah, it wasn't a pretty game. I mean, it's 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 a lot to ask for a first year starter in that kind of situation. I don't think it's you know just a book thing. I think you know it, that. Oh what, yeah. What was, it was just you know, an ugly game? It was just an ugly game. It's it's a uh, it was a battle of kind of some you know kind of poor game plans and a lot of injuries as well because you know the Saints fought different situations last year. So it's just, I don't think Book was to blame, but yes, a very, very ugly game. Well, the other side of this, they obviously wanted veteran experience. You know, you get that with Andy Dalton. That's basically all you get with Andy Dalton is experience. He's on the backside <laughs> right now. Uh, we, you know, we saw it with the Cowboys a couple of years ago. The Bears saw it last year. Andy Dalton is Andy Dalton. At this point, the unfortunate thing for Ian Book, I think, is Sean Payton decided to retire. Yeah, that's the, the real season. the part and, that kind of hurt him yeah. and the whole team. And, you know, it was when a guy like Sean Payton leaves, that's that's probably more than likely a Hall of Fame coach. So, right when he leaves, there's going to be trouble no matter what. <laughs> Another former Irish player, Kevin Austin Jr., cut by the Jacksonville Jaguars, and this is a guy who could really should still be <laughs> with Notre Dame right now. Um, how big a misread do you think this was for him to declare for the draft is just the way things have turned out right now? You know, obviously right now hindsight looks, it, it makes the situation a lot worse because Notre Dame is battling injuries and depth at wide receiver. And of course, you know, having a, someone with an experience is always going to help. 
uh, a group that's kind of short right now. But, you know, ultimately, even even before those injuries happened, I just the only thing that Kevin Austin had to his name was his speed. And, you know, I get that's that's something that you can't be taught in an intangible and a lot of, you know, things a lot of NFL teams will like. I think he'll end up on a practice squad somewhere just for those reasons, his speed. Um, but, yeah, he really could have used a fifth year when it comes to his development, his route running, basically everything outside of just having speed. You know, I'm not I'm not saying that he was bad at those other areas, uh, but I really think he could have benefited off a of fifth year. And if he would have came back, you know, he could have maybe been a premier wide receiver in the offense, considering, you know, there wasn't a lot of depth. And, you know, you're starting a new system with a quarterback and a guy with him like speed. They're going to find ways to get him open. So I think yeah. he really missed out on a, a big year of development for him personally. Um, but, you know, it's so hard to say those things right now. In the moment, I'm sure it was he felt good and he he really wanted to capitalize on a, his opportunity to, you know, be in the NFL. Yeah, I'm not sure you know, what exactly, you know, kind of advice that he got. But uh, obviously the way it turned out, it was not sound advice. And I think just the fact, you know, like, like right now you talk about the chance to get a year of development you you got chancy stucky here and you so you've got a much better wide receivers coach you hear these receivers raving about chancy stucky and just what they've learned from him in a short amount of time i think it would have been really beneficial to kevin austin it would have been huge for the notre dame offense to have a guy like him back this year especially considering where that receivers room is salty Virginia Peanut says, to be fair to Ian Book, he only got one walk through with the starters that week. COVID disrupted everything. And I agree with that. I'm not trying to put it all on him. I'm just right. saying it was an ugly game. I, I, I remember trying to watch that game. I think it was a Thursday night game. It was game a too. Thursday night game, which yeah. also doesn't help things when you're on a short week and backup quarterbacks. It's like yeah. that's <laughs> Thursday just, games are ugly in general, yeah. it seems like. And exactly. then you throw in everything else. And it's like, exactly. this is going to be a <laughs> complete mess. <laughs> yep, that's right. So, again, don't forget two shows a day here on the old Irish Breakdown channels. You find us live on YouTube every day and, of course, wherever you get your podcasts as well. Post game show after the game Saturday and, you know, throughout the season as well. We've just got tons of stuff going on. Got a big breakdown Jesse's going to give us here in a little bit. I want to talk about Tyler Buckner, though, first. Is Tyler Buckner ready to be the man? He's actually going to be speaking with the media tonight after practice so we'll kind of get a chance to hear some of his comments what are you most confident in with Tyler Buckner going into this game Jess you know this is hard to say because Tyler Buckner obviously last year he he wasn't the starter right he, he came in in a lot of kind of in 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 game situations um he started obviously he started the one game but he he didn't start a game from start to finish the entire last year this is his first time he's going to be doing that um, so it's really hard to judge a guy based off of that alone. You know, he, he, I don't, there's not a lot of film on him or, you know, his playmaking ability, but what I'm most confident in is his playmaking ability. I think he's a natural kind of born, his best talent is that he's a natural born athlete. There'll be instances in the game where Bugner are gonna, is going to have to, you know, resort to those natural instincts and make a play almost like a fight or flight situation. And I think as long as he's smart, that those kind of instincts and natural talent will help him a lot in the game. And another thing I'm really confident in is his preparation for the game, you know, obviously individually and what the coaching staff has done to get him ready for the game. I think he's very well equipped with a game plan uh, that can produce a victory. So I think the things I'm most confident in is, like I said, his playmaking ability when things are going to break down, his, his natural instinct to be an athlete, and then also, you know, his preparation and the staff's preparation – uh, and him specifically to have him ready for this game. I think those are the things I'm most confident in. Yeah, the preparation is the biggest thing that I'm most confident in. I'm, I'm confident that he's prepared. He's been holding away there in the film room. It, you know, in addition to what he's doing on the practice field, obviously, I'm confident that he's been preparing himself and that Tommy Reese is going to put him in the best possible position right. to be able to succeed. We, we talk about it all the time, how Tommy Reese – is going to play to the strengths of who he has. And you know he's not going to necessarily – it's funny because someone asked Tommy Reese the other day, hey, can you can you run tempo offense on the road, you know, in this night game with first-time starter and all that? And Tommy said – he kind of chuckled and he said, we'll find out Saturday, you know. So it, it, there might come a time when they have to do it. It's – again, it's going to look different, but I'm, I'm confident in who Tyler Buckner is – 
as an athlete and that he is going to be prepared. He is much better prepared for this than he was like even last year when he played Virginia Tech because Tommy has talked about the environment and he's talked about that Virginia Tech environment. He's been in that kind of situation, hostile, on the road, night game, all those different things. I don't know that Virginia Tech, you know, like it's it, enter Sandman is one thing, but as we found out two different times, once enter Sandman ends and Virginia Tech's getting their butts kicked, it gets pretty quiet inside that city. <laughs> I was getting ready to say there's it's <laughs> one, it's not the overall capacity in which Ohio State is, and uh-huh. two, it's like enter Sandman the entire game, especially you know, it's assuming that it's a close game. I mean, it, it's gonna be crazy there. You know, students just got back this week. It's the first game of the season. It's a night game. It's a top five matchup. Like it is, I, I'm sorry, but it's nothing compared to what Virginia Tech is. I mean, I know he's got to, you know, p- mentally prepare and all those things, but it, it is going to be inter Sandman from the first snap to the very last snap. So I yeah. hope he's ready the entire game. It's not going to be, you know, things are going to dwindle down or settle down. It's it's going to be pretty hectic the entire game. And listen, everyone's got different takes on Tyler Buckner. That's okay because we're watching – an athlete as opposed to a finished product where I think we're seeing the start of what can be a really, really good college quarterback, but it's just the start of it. You know, like we saw this, essentially this raw piece of clay, just running around and using his legs. Most of the time last year, it is more developed this year. And I I realize again, that there are different opinions on who this guy is right now. He's not a finished product, but I think we're still going. I I guess I'll just leave it at this. We're all going to see part of what Tyler Buckner is Saturday night, good or bad. I don't think, well, I mean, if it's really good, then, then you can base a lot on that, but even like middle to, you know, so, so, or bad or, or whatever, I don't think you're going to be able to, 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 to base everything on what you see Saturday night because of the environment, the team they're playing, and the whole thing. I think he's going to be at least good enough based on what we've seen. But again, we've also seen snippets of practice, and it, you know we haven't seen foam blown live and all that kind of stuff. And so, really, you know, like if I go to to what I'm most concerned in or concerned about, that's what it is. Just the fact that. Who is Tyler Buckner going to be when the heat's on now? Does he make the right pre-snap reads? Do, you know, Does he change the protections and all those things? This is stuff that Tommy Reese, again, was talking about with him the other day. Does he recognize coverages once the play has, is live? Is he trying to be too fine with his passes? Like I don't think, again, like last year, because of the fact that he was not nearly as prepared as he is this year going into the season, and the few opportunities that we did see him passing it was almost you know like he was either trying to guide it in or, or or you know maybe he was surprised a little bit by what he saw but because of the preparation he has and all the repetitions that he has I'm not as concerned about that I'm just you know I'm I'm not worried about him delivering the ball it's it's all the other stuff that's around him you know in the moment and and just everything that comes with facing an actual live defense and doing those things because we haven't really got to see enough of that to to have much to base anything on right now yeah i like like you were saying my biggest concern going forward uh is buckner's ability to know to when when to get rid of the ball when the pocket is collapsing when to slide down and avoid the big hit you know to to preserve injury or a fumble or that kind of thing it basically the fine line of knowing when it's appropriate to extend the play and when is appropriate to fight another down or possession because, you know, in short, my biggest concern is his ability to not turn the ball over given the the big, you know, environment and, and situation that he's going to be in as a first time starter. And I think this game will get out of hand very quickly if Notre Dame turns the ball over. If Buckner turns the ball over more than twice, I really don't see a way that Notre Dame can win this game because Ohio State is going to score and they can't run away with the game, uh, you know, knowing what this offense is going to try to accomplish. Um, but going back to another point that you made earlier, I really think that Tyler Buckner has been put in a very good, you know, game plan uh, by the coaching staff to, to to win this game. If Buckner executes what he needs to do, Notre Dame can win this game. I know, you know, I sound a little crazy, or you know, we're all Notre Dame fans, but 
they're 17 and a half point underdogs right now. I think, you know, first of all, that's completely outrageous. But if Notre Dame can execute in all three phases, they take care of the ball. Um, and Tommy, or, you know, Tyler Buckner does what he's supposed to, uh, you know, in, in the game plan. I don't think that there's any reason why this game doesn't come down to the fourth quarter on Saturday. Yeah. And I think it's really interesting that when you look at Tyler Buckner and Notre Dame this year, they're both in the exact same situation Ohio State was in last. Well, maybe not exact, but in the same situation, essentially not playing quite as good an opponent. But remember, C.J. Stroud, to start his career, Thursday night at Minnesota, they fell behind early before they ended up coming back to win. But again, night game on the road, and it's it, that was C.J. Stroud's first start, and it's going to be the same for Tyler Buckner now, night game on the road. Again, the level of competition is better, but there's, there's going to be – we're going to see the answers at least – at least partial answers to a lot of questions Saturday night. Again, you know, this this Ohio State team right there with Clemson and Alabama, even they've even been more consistent than Georgia in terms of making the college football playoff. Now, Georgia is kind of on a different trajectory right now, obviously, after just winning a national championship. But they are what they are for a reason, and they've got a ton back. Now, they have the big question, of course, on the defensive side of the ball, and we're going to get to some of that as well. I think Tyler Buckner is ready because of the preparation. And as you well know, being an athlete, preparation, one, preparation helps breed luck. You know, like you hear people say, well, they're lucky. Well, if you're prepared, then luck tends to to fall your way. (laughs) You find yourself in the right spot when you're prepared. That's right. That's exactly right. The more prepared you are, the more luck seems to find you. And uh, obviously the more prepared you are, the more confident you are as well. And that's something else that Tommy Reese has talked a lot about. Marcus Freeman said yesterday with Tyler Buckner as well, the confidence that he has, like he continues to get more confidence. And I think it has to do with the preparation. And again, just the reps and the doing it that he wasn't necessarily doing last year as a package quarterback. So I I think we're all going to see a lot different looking Tyler Buckner than anyone got used to seeing last year in those small doses that we saw. So I'm pretty confident in him going into Saturday night. Yeah, same. And I, I think uh, like we were talking about with being prepared and being ready, you know, that's that's like <laughs> that's like 50 percent of the battle is you gain an extra step by just being prepared and knowing where you need to be, you know, based off of your pre snap read and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, one second in terms of a very fast paced sport can mean all the difference. So being prepared just gives you that extra chance of, like you were saying, to make more plays or plays to kind of fall into place just because you're simply prepared. Yeah. Yeah, and like Michael was saying, playing last year no matter where and what package uh, helps a ton. And I, I agree with that. Just Just getting him on the field, and that was the objective last year. Find a way to get him on the field so that when he was going into this situation now as the starter at Ohio State to open the season, it's something I talked about on my show quite a bit last year and and even before that, I think like how do you, you know, what's what is the what is the whole lead up, ramp up need to be for Tyler Buckner? I think it was really important just to get him on that field. And again, I saw somebody say why all the talk about Virginia Tech because that's what Tommy Reese keeps coming back to when when he talks about is Tyler Buckner ready for the environment? He talks about, well, that was his most extensive action. He played on the road in a night game, hostile environment against Virginia Tech. But, you know, he also got in in home night game. Notre Dame's biggest rival, obviously, in North Carolina as well. So just getting him in there in those situations, I think your legs are going to be a lot less rubbery going into the horseshoe after having at least gone through some of that last year compared to if you're just going in without any experience at all. You're going in blind with no experience. So I think last year was really invaluable for him. I definitely agree with that. All right, let's look at some specific stuff as we look at Ohio State in this matchup with Notre Dame. Let's start with Notre Dame's offense, Jess. Now, do you have some graphics for this, or or what are you <laughs> what are you what are you gonna bring us here? You were you were like experimenting with some other stuff, you know, after we finally got things rectified in the, in 
in the back end when we were having trouble getting the show started tonight do you have so do you have graphics for this or are you saving that for the defensive side no I, i'm gonna i'm gonna pull it up i'm gonna preface here a little bit and then kind of halfway okay. through i'll pull up some stuff that'll okay. that'll hopefully make things give a nice visual for the audience out there so here's the quote now if you're listening of course on the podcast later on well maybe you want to just go find the youtube video but <laughs> <laughs> if you want to see it but we'll talk about it as best we can as well offensively jess how do you think Notre Dame can manipulate or take advantage of the box with their offensive game plan against Jim Knowles and this defense that the Buckeyes are going to throw out there? You know, I, I thought about this for a good amount of time, and I thought about, you know, what's the best way to keep this concise? Um, and I think in order – and this is obviously my opinion uh, – I, I think that offensively Notre Dame's game plan, if they want the best chance at success, would have to be manipulating the box with a lot of two tight end sets. Uh, we talked about this a little bit last week on Thursday. I think Notre Dame really has to to go with the two tight end sets, and I'll show you uh, here why in a little in, in a second. But in doing so, Notre Dame must establish a run game if they want to win this game. You're gonna, I think I've said it like 50 times. If Notre Dame can run the ball for more than 150 yards, I'll, I, I might even take that down to like 125. They will win this game. Look at last year against well, Michigan. People uh, scoffed yesterday when Marcus Freeman, all these people were, you know, like throwing it back. Oh, when Marcus Freeman said, run the ball and oh. stop the run, people were, oh, what, you know, establish the run. You know, what, what game does he think he's playing? Like nobody runs the ball in college football or something. I mean, <laughs> Travian Henderson for Ohio State ran the ball for over 1,200 yards last year. Right, exactly. So, there's a couple of things that running the ball does. One, it, it it lengthens out your possessions. Even if you're not scoring, you're eating up a lot of clock. That keeps your defense, you know, rested and off the field. Uh, and with Ohio State's high-powered offense, you're going to have to do that. And the, the thing that I, you know, I was looking at with this is last year when Michigan, you know, embarrassed Ohio State, I would say Michigan ran the ball for 282 combined yards that day, and C.J. Right. Stroud still threw for 400 yards, and they won that game. It, it C.J. Stroud can pass for however much he wants to, but if Notre Dame can run the ball and they can stop the run, like Marcus Freeman was talking about, this will be a very, very good game. You know, Notre Dame has a very talented offensive line and arguably the best tackle duo in the country, and they have to dominate in the trenches to pave the way for the run game. The two tight end sets allow for, obviously, two more bodies up front and extra blocking, um, and this is where I'm going to kind of bring up a graphic here to kind of show what I'm talking about. I think the people are going to love this. Just let me get it up on my screen real quick. Uh, you let me know. you're not overselling yourself right now. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, can you see my screen right now? Yeah. Do you want me to, do you want me to throw that in there? Yeah, there, there go. we go. That's perfect. Okay. So this is, this is what I'm talking about here. We have the center represented by the triangle. We'll have star represented by the quarterback. And my diamonds on the end here, what going to represent uh, these tight ends? But really, you know, the first thing that you can do when you manipulate the box with these two tight ends is you already see up front, we're working with seven guys, uh, you know, opposed to the seven over here. And then you, 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 run, the, you run the ball through, you know, through here, you're, you're going to control the box with having how, you know, having seven guys in here committed already. And then when you bring down, you know, potentially, okay, let's, let's get rid of a wide receiver over here and bring him into the backfield, maybe bring in, you know, a combined Tyree and Estime look here. Okay, well, what are you going to do? First of all, what are you going to do with, you know, seven seven guys down here on the line with only four? You're going to have to bring this guy down. You're going to have to walk this safety down a little bit. So now we're talking eight in the box. The safety is, you know, back over the top. And sorry, I got a little bit ahead of myself. Let me bring this wide receiver, you know, out here. It, that already allows for, say, this you know this wide receiver for whatever reason. Whoops, sorry, everyone. They decide to to pass the ball off of this eventually. What's going to happen is, is if this guy goes up here and this guy goes up here. Okay, well, where's the safety going to go? Is he going to go here? Is he going to go here? You got a one on one matchup on either side, depending on where the safety goes. And then say, I don't know, maybe the running back wants to run out underneath here. Now you got a linebacker trying to cover Chris Tyree. You know, a, a very fast, speedy back who can catch the ball of the backfield one on one. So that's a big situation you already have with two tight ends is you force Ohio State to bring eight guys into the box. Um, and, and you're really looking to go smash mouth in this situation. And once you go RPO off this look, okay, we fake the run. You're already going to have 
some sort of one-on-one -on -one matchup, depending on, you know, where the safety goes, assuming these linebackers get sucked up by the run. And that's why it's so important to establish the run game early is because these linebackers are going to have to respect the run game. If you can run the ball, it only allows for this play and this play to open up. And that's, you know, that's just going with the balance. Look, two tight ends, one tight end on each side. Now, here's what I really kind of want to get into. Let me get back to my pointer. See, okay. I like uh, what you're showing right there. I, you know, I don't mind like the two tight ends. I think we're going to see Michael Mayer, you know, like you might see 12 personnel, but I think you're going to see Michael Mayer split out somewhere. Like, I think one of the things, like if you've ever watched Tom Brady and their offense, one of the things that he does a lot is they'll show you a, one personnel grouping, but then they will do the opposite of what you think that they would do out of that grouping. Like what you're showing there with 12 personnel and you've got all, you know, these two attached tight ends and a couple of, of receivers out, what they would do is throw the ball kind of, you know, a, a little bit what you're talking about. Whereas, you know, maybe they spread it out. Now you've got guys all over the field and that's when they would run the ball, you know? So that's, 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 I don't know. I'll, I'll I'll let you continue, but that's just the thought that comes to mind when you look at, you know, again, when you're talking about how you're going to man manipulate Jim Knowles in that defense with what you throw out there on the field. Yeah, and in that you know, that's a very good point. And I think another thing you, you were talking about, you know, splitting Mayer out and, and a two tight end look, which you can do still because you can have this tight end here, you split out Mayer, and still it very much helps your run game. And because, you know, this is Mayer's almost a decoy at this point. If he can seal this guy out and this wide and this corner, you know, this wide receiver seals this corner and then you get your tackle sealing off here and then maybe pull the guard here. I mean, your running back is running Scott, you know, clean free there with just a safety to beat. So it, it again, the two tight end look just it really forces Ohio State to come down into the box uh, and it utilizes Notre Dame's best weapon offensively. And that is these guys up front right here. I think Notre Dame has to – these guys and, and, and combined with Buckner are really what's going to dictate the game this weekend because, you know, if you can punch – consistently punch Ohio State in the mouth time after time, you know, running the ball like this is going to get – you know, going to wear them down. And like I here's, said Mich – Mich sorry, go ahead. Well, here's a question that I have for you because I think a lot of these – like where you have linebackers, I think some of those bodies are going to be safeties because Jim Knowles has talked about this is a safety-driven defense that he has. So, you know, like when you're talking about matching up body on body, if you've got bigger bodies, again, you know, on, on Notre Dame's side against faster bodies, essentially, how does that sort of affect what you're talking about there? Yeah, so – I think that even helps, you know, Notre Dame out a little bit more because this, you know, essentially what would happen is if that's what they're going to do, okay, maybe they, instead of a lineman, they kick out and have more of like a safety guy here, a safety guy here, and then they'll have two true linebackers kind of in the middle here, right. kick out, you kick out this guy, you kick out this guy, Oop, let's just get rid of that line actually, you know, you kick this guy over just a little bit. And at that point, it still works to, to Notre Dame's, advantage because these guys are these safeties are going to be smaller than linebackers so yes they'll be a little bit you know faster but what we just talked about is Notre Dame if Notre Dame's gonna to have to use its physical dominance okay well it's easier to phys physically dominate a smaller player so if Ohio State wants to use hybrid safeties that's that's fine because that's an easier block that's an easier guy to seal I guarantee a linebacker is going to have a much easier time getting off a block uh, then, then you know what what a hybrid kind of safety would look like, but still it forces the the main thing is it forces Ohio State to configure what are they going to do with the box? They're going to have to have eight guys down there if Notre Dame brings seven of these bodies into the box like this, and it doesn't even have to be Mayer attached to the line of scrimmage. He can be out wide. This tight end can be out wide too. You can still accomplish power running schemes by doing those sort of things. And the last thing I kind of want to go into offensively that they can do with the hang on, hang on just a sec because we got people pining for the fullbacks right now <laughs> and i just want to address that davis sherwood is a fullback so i will be i will be curious to see like if we see some davis sherwood in some short yardage 
situations out there. Somebody said, isn't there a local kid? Uh, the former Mishawaka quarterback, Justin Fisher, is listed on the Notre Dame roster as a fullback. They actually have both Fisher and Sherwood working with the tight ends as opposed to the running backs. So just, just for what it's worth, they do have some, at least in name, fullbacks on the roster this year. Whether or not they use them, that's another story. Go ahead, yes. Yeah. So the last thing I wanted to get into that you can do with the two tight end set is basically this this tight end acts as a fullback. He's called the up back, the H back, you know, whatever you want to call him. And this is a big pivotal role uh, because once again, you know, I, I I think the biggest question, and you brought up a very good point, is if Notre Dame splits Mayer out, yes, they're going to walk down this guy, right? And they're, they're going to go with four down linemen. There's no way that they're going to go five down linemen and let Mayer get off with, with a clean release over here, right? But as soon as you bring in Mayer and you bring in this H back up here, you have to go five down linemen. There's, they will get eaten up alive if they don't go five down linemen. And then that switches this over here, this over here, and this over here. We're going to see a lot of this or what we were just kind of showing, that kind of 4-4 look or this 5-3 look. But what's so important about this look right here with the two tight ends uh, – I keep hitting that stupid button um, – with the two tight end look here is now you, you get this guy steam rolling up through the hole. You know, he, he's either going to seal this guy. He's going to seal this guy. Mayor is probably, you know, going to seal this guy. This guy's going to come up here. The tackle is going to lead up here and seal whatever guy the H back doesn't get. And now the running back is going clean through the hole and one-on-one with the free safety. Okay, now let's talk about Tyler Buckner's best attribute. He pulls this ball. This guy's coming down here. I mean, who, who's got Buckner in that situation? You know, who in his natural ability to run the ball, this this it could you could almost run a double power scheme. You could run this guy up here, this guy up here, and then Buckner coming through after that. I mean, I, I don't know why Notre Dame would not want to smack Ohio State like this physically dominate and exert themselves all game long because what opens up the most important thing off of this is what opens up this is the RPO looks. Okay, now he can pull it back and all these guys are sucked up in here. Safety, you know, creeping down a little bit. Boom, this guy releases. This guy runs a post. That's you got one or two guys to beat on the outside. Yeah, that's all you got to Tyler beat. Buckner. And that's that's going to work to Tyler Buckner's you know ability because it's his first game as a starter. What do you want to do for your quarterback in his first game at Ohio State on the road? Make his looks easier. Get one-on-one -on -one matchups. Make sure he doesn't have to read zone looks or any sort of disguises. So this is really why I like the tight end look, uh, the double tight end look, because it simplifies things and it puts guys in the box. It makes things a lot easier to read for Tyler Buckner. This looks like a lot of scribbles now. But I hope it was very helpful for everyone. <laughs> well, it's interesting because you like them being in the box. See, I like it. You know, I would I would think it would be the other way around. But I, you know, again, I guess, you know, like is this offense going to look more like 2020 or is it going to look more like 2021? You know, 2020, when you really had the definition of smash smash mouth football with Tommy Tremble doing a lot of the stuff that you're talking about with that H back back there. So be really curious. Let's flip it to the defensive side of the ball. Really good breakdown there offensively. And I mean, when you when you add in Audric Estime to that mix, you know, I, th I think that that kind of even adds to the excitement as well when you're talking about the possibilities for Notre Dame in the run game. All right. So now what are we doing defensively? So this, you know, this is I no longer our you know, Diamonds tight end representative. This is just kind of <laughs> probably, you know, what basic basic Ohio State stuff here. You know, this is going to be their their base offense. Two split out, you know, one wide receiver. Okay, they might bring this guy in and, you know, still have this guy split out like this, which is fine. Uh, you know, Notre Dame is going to run four down linemen uh, predominantly, which is what they should do. Because Notre Dame can get home with four players. Not a lot of teams in college football can say that. And what I mean by getting home is they can collapse that pocket and get pressure on Stroud and not have to worry about bringing more than four people, uh, which is essentially pretty crucial when you're playing an offense like this uh, because, of, you know, their passing dominance is this allows, you know, more guys for Notre Dame to be in coverage 
Uh, and and to, to really go into the main point of what I'm trying to get at here is Notre Dame has to disguise their coverages and what they're going to do uh, with the blitzing scheme. I said, you know, I get it. Yes, they can get home with four people. But what are they going to do creative wise to get four people there? Do they bring this kind of twist? You know, this guy coming in here, this guy diving in down here and this guy coming in down here. There's a million different things, you know, you can do with these different combinations up here. I've even, you know, seen teams go crash. You know, this guy comes down and around and then, OK. Building off of that, the, the next biggest question is what can they do with the fifth man? Because if they bring any sort of fifth man, they're going to have to, you know, it, it has to be almost a sack because you're compromising a guy uh, in, in coverage. So the biggest things that Notre Dame can do defensively wise is very their, you know, their blitzes and, and disguise pressures and, and really, you know, do things to throw Stroud off Stroud off. And, and a big thing that I like to do uh, or that I've seen that works well, you know, against quarterbacks is let me get rid of some of these lines real quick a, a simple kind of pressure which you can get that really you know throws throws the quarterback off is once you get into here and you you know you have you bring five guys uh maybe you know maybe this guy this guy bails out this guy's this is going to be called a viking so this defensive end will drop and kind of take this area and then instead this guy is going to fold down into here he's going to blitz off his butt into here we're crashing you know we're crashing and then potentially you bring this guy down into here too. So again, this defensive end is going to kick out into coverage, but this linebacker is going to be coming. So, you know, that's a way you disguise pressure and coverage at the same time. This guy can kick out underneath here. He can maybe kick out under here under a curl, but instead you're going to bring this guy off of him, you know, with your three up front. And then that's a simple, you know, four man disguise. And then maybe you bring this guy too off this side because he's so focused on here. And then, okay, all of a sudden, we have a blind side, you know, sack over here. So, like I said, the thing that Notre Dame needs to do uh, the most with CJ Stroud is disguise. What are they going to do with their four men? And that's going to be their base. You know, what kind of stunts can they come up with with only bringing four guys? And then, okay, occasionally we really need to help our secondary out here. What fifth guy are we going to bring them? And then how are we going to bring them? Let me ask you. Let me ask you something because where uh, Oklahoma State again. Uh, where Oklahoma State had success in the second half in the Fiesta Bowl, where they really exposed Notre Dame, and they don't have near the quarterback or receivers that Ohio State are going to have, they switched to 10 personnel. They just took the tight end off the field, four receivers, and a running back. So I would I, I would think that we're that we probably see that at some point. If you're Ohio State now, from a Notre Dame perspective, I think they're deeper in the secondary this year than they were last year. Again, we're probably going to see Jaden Mickey and Benjamin Morrison, a couple of freshmen. They are also they have good depth with the safeties. You know they've they've got what four guys back there who are probably all going to play. We're going to see five corners who are probably going to play. But how could Notre Dame potentially? What's that look like from their perspective if Ohio State takes that tight end off the field and all of a sudden they've got four receivers out there pretty consistently? Yeah, so I, I think you know, ten like we were talking, like you were saying, ten personnel is going to be you know predominantly what Ohio State is going to want to run. You know, one running back, four split out wide, taking the tight end off the field. I mean, really, all that's going to do defensively wise is. You're going to have this kind of situation. This guy's going to maybe cheat, be walked down a little bit. He's going to be kind of up here. So this is this is your free safety. This is this your is strong Brandon safety. Brandon Joseph, yeah. Yeah. Uh, these, are, these are your corners out here, corner out here. Um, and then these are kind of, you know, your this is a linebacker uh, and more of like a, you know, hybrid role. You could obviously bring in kind of a nickel situation, uh, you know, where you're bringing another, an extra, you know, like you were saying, defensive back on the field. Um, and, and when you know it's going to be 10 personnel and really what's what the, the hard thing about this is, is, you know, this this put first puts Ohio State in a bind because now you only have five guys to block, you know, for a very talented four man group. But the main thing here is these guys have to you know be able to, to split in between this guy and this guy so they can effectively, you know, if they need to, you still have to be able to respect the run game. 
you know, take a, this kind of lane right in here, uh, but at the same time still be able to play this guy and then have some sort of combo coverage with this safety, you know, helping with these guys. And then obviously this these guys being helped by this safety in a, in, in a sort of combo coverage. And that that ultimately, you know, that that's going to put this guy in a very big bind because we know Travion Henderson is a very talented back. And right. that locks that locks up these guys one on one, essentially, you know, because this guy's going to be here. This guy's going to be here. This guy's going to be this guy, this guy. Help, help. So then what are they going to do, you know, to, to limit kind of Henderson in this situation, you know, assuming that he, he catches the ball out of the backfield. Um, but, you know, it, it is also still tricky in turn personnel in the run game. Uh, but that's why these guys are going to be put in a tough spot. Because, again, it's the same situation Ohio State will be facing. If Notre Dame switches out to maybe more nickel or dime kind of personnel in this situation, okay, well, then let's run, you know, Henderson through here. These guys have to be ready to squeeze down, squeeze down, uh, and, and protect that run game at the same time. So I think 10 personnel is very tricky for Notre Dame because they need to decide what they're going to do matchup-wise uh, with these two guys right here. Can they – can they still, you know, provide relief in the coverage game, uh, but at the same time, you know, provide relief or, you know, be able to hold their own in the run game, uh, assuming that Ohio State, you know, runs the ball out of this as well. Sure. All right. I'm busy. Film session with Jesse <laughs> tonight. Sorry, I got going in it. I wasn't ready for the mobile chalkboard that you were going to bring in. That was a lot of great stuff, though. A lot of stuff to ingest. If you missed any of that, you want to go back and watch it on the video because there was a lot there. I'm just, you know, again, I think on both sides of the ball, it's it's going to be a little bit of a chess match, a chess match in terms of what personnel they use. Exactly. As you said, like with Notre Dame, can they get home with four guys? How often can they get home with four guys? And it's going to be a big matchup between Isaiah Foskey and Paris Johnson on that side, you know, assuming that they're are matched up with each other and that's you know Johnson moving out to to tackle this year after playing guard last year but uh I I just think that it's there, there's going to be pieces moving all over the place Notre Dame's got so much personnel they can use offensively and as far as Ohio State goes man I think it's just mostly going to be how can we turn this thing into a track meet and and run them into the ground as quickly as possible I think that that's what uh Ohio State is going to try to do. Yeah, I, I really think the game is going to be dictated uh, ultimately by the trenches. You know, Notre Dame has to dominate on defense with their four men up front uh, and, and get home like we were talking about. And offensively, they have to, you know, just bear down in the trenches and establish that run game. I think if Notre Dame wins in the trenches on both sides of the ball, they will win the entire game. No question about it. I don't – Ohio State doesn't want to be punched in the mouth. They showed that last year against Michigan in a physical game, you know, where a team is running the ball and, and just playing adequate enough defense, getting to Stroud when they need to. Uh, teams can win the game, and I think that's what's going to happen this weekend. All right. Salty's trying to get you a job. He said Notre Dame has a grad <laughs> assistant position open. So You never know. You never know. <laughs> that's right. That's this right. Is, this is my favorite stuff right here because you really get to see. It's, it's so hard to talk about these things without the visual because you can't account for all 11 players and you know one guy's one guy's different align uh, alignment or kind of maybe you know positioning or what he's going to do really can dictate the entire play and that's that's ideally what defensive and offensive coordinators are trying to do in, in a single play is exploit one guy to get a mismatch that they want yeah and i'm you know Notre Dame has a new defensive coordinator third in as many years but you do still have at least as Ryan Day said in his press conference today, there's still some fingerprints, I'm sure, that Marcus Freeman's going to have on the defense. Like it doesn't look a whole lot different what we've different what we've seen out there, Al Golden from Marcus Freeman. But on the other side, they you know, they did bring in Jim Knowles. And so we're basing a lot of what we think about Ohio State on what we saw last year, but they brought in a new defensive coordinator for a reason. So Notre Dame did have some success against that defense, but again. The personnel is going to be better. I'm not overly impressed with Ohio State's defensive line. I know they've got some five-star guys on it's that not line. Good. <laughs> but they have really, for five-star guys, they have vastly underperformed. And the thing is, the one defensive 
assistant they kept was the defensive line coach, Larry Johnson. So I know, you know, that like some of these guys are, well, I'm in the best shape of my life mode and all that kind of stuff like everybody is at this time of year. But yeah, like the defensive line was not that great. The linebackers were not great last year. Again, they're, they're going to rely on safeties more this year, <laughs> it sounds like. But exactly how that pans, you know, again, like like you said, if, if they're going to rely on safeties against Notre Dame, then I think Notre Dame has the personnel to make it a long night for Ohio State if they want to go that direction. I mean, the last thing I would want to see as an undersized linebacker at Ohio State, because that's what it is. You know, Ohio State linebackers aren't your typical, you know, <laughs> linebacker. They're, they're more of, you know, a guy who's going to be better in coverage. He's not – they're not going to be, you know – super sound big beefed up for the run game and yeah the last thing i would want to see is two tight end sets and big audrick estime and logan D Diggs on the field just smashing in your mouth all game long I, I i just really think that if ohio state wants to go with you know more safeties that really plays into notre dame's favor because notre dame's you know notre dame's advantage is that they are bigger and more physical uh and that's what they're going to have to do to win the game Looks like we have a Buckeye fan in in the house tonight. Welcome, glad glad to have you with it's us. It's so funny because you know have I, a little I, fun. I, have a little I think fun. If for those of you who don't know, I live in Ohio. I live in Cleveland, Ohio. I work right. with a majority. Ohio football is Ohio State football. They don't care about the Bengals and the Browns because you know they've sucked for a while now. And so everyone is an Ohio State football fan, and that's all. I've, I've gotten like three texts this week. You ready to lose by thirty? My boss on Monday. Hey, you ready to? to get, you know, for Ohio State to run over Notre Dame all night long. I was like, let's just – everyone, let's just watch the game. I know, you know, Notre Dame's got a lot of question marks, but they'll, they'll be ready out there, and this is a good point too. Yeah, Knowles' <laughs> defense gave up a lot last year, and Ohio State's defense was equally as bad last year. So, you know, what are you ultimately changing? It's the same personnel. It, it just maybe a year develops. So – I really don't think Ohio State's defense is in very good shape. And just because they added Knowles doesn't just magically fix things, in my opinion. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Slogo says he's kind of new here. Are you two related? <laughs> Take a wild guess. <laughs> I don't know. Styers is like Smith, I guess, right? It's a pretty common name, so right? I'm joking, of course. <laughs> Jesse, great breakdown tonight. Let's do this. How about some rapid fire? I'm always down for the rapid fire. I think I think I went over my allotted segment time, so I think a little rapid fire might make up for it. We'll just I'll be short and concise. If if anyone knows, you don't me, have to be short and concise. Let's just do it. I get long winded. <laughs> over under 29 and a half total touchdowns for Tyler Buckner this season. 29 and a half um, is the number. So, you know, that assumes probably about two and a half a game, maybe one passing, one rushing per game. They're going to have some weaker opponents. You know, what the heck? I'm going to go with the over on this one. I think he gets there, <laughs> and I only think he gets there because of his uh, ability to score touchdowns on his feet as well. I think that's going to be critical in the red zone. I think he's going to get a couple of those walk-in, you know, quarterback ones where the whole defense just doesn't account for him and he'll go untouched. So I'm going to go over purely because I think he gets some of those running touchdowns in there. So I set this number 29 and a half as the over under just kind of like, okay, first year starting quarterback. We know he's got legs. He's probably going to get to the end zone with his legs. And that's why the number was set where it was because, you know, like I said, total touchdowns, that means passing and rushing and so I said it not remembering exactly what Brandon Wimbush had done in 2017 and again I think Tyler Buckner is going to be a better passer than Brandon Wimbush like like I don't know if if people remember but like the next season 2018 when the media was out there at Notre Dame Stadium and they had a net set up and Ian Book was just dropping dimes in this net you know just throwing to the net throwing footballs to the net and Brandon Wimbush not so much you know he was spraying <laughs> balls all around the net Tyler Buckner can find the net so at least we know Tyler Buckner can hit the net you know it's like a point of comparison and it's this is you know I'm not I'm not trying to take shots at Brandon Wimbush my point though mobile quarterback 
good arm, you know, strong arm, the whole thing. Brandon Wimbush could obviously fly. Brandon Wimbush, 30 total touchdowns in his first season as a starter in 2017. I set the over-under again at 29 and a half without first looking at that number. I think that that Tyler Buckner is going to get there. I think he is good for at least a dozen rushing touchdowns. That's going to be a huge factor down in the red zone when we see that. Tyler Buckner and that running ability that he has. So, so you know, if he has 12, then you're talking about he needs 18 touchdown passes. And I think, you know, like like Vince probably has Michael Mayer with like 30 touchdown catches himself this year. <laughs> so so I've got to go over on this one. I think I think Tyler Buckner is going to count for at least 30 touchdowns this season between rushing and passing the ball. Okay, so yesterday, Marcus Freeman, I, I had this soundbite and the soundbite's not working, so I'm not going to play it. Um, Marcus Freeman said yesterday, if he wins the coin toss, he kind of went back and forth, you know, like, well, if it's this situation, this, if it's that situation, this, but if uh, if I had to make a decision today, I would defer. So he says he would defer. Brian Kelly, of course, notoriously liked to take the football, always took the ball in the first half. What do you think about Marcus Freeman and deferring if he wins the coin toss? I am uh, I'm a big fan of the defer as well. I, I I see both sides of the coin. You know, obviously you want to get the ball, go punch someone in the mouth and score first. But, you know, that all works great until you don't score on your first possession. And then it, it's completely, you know, a disadvantage at that point. You and if you're going to take the ball, the only way that it's an advantage is if you score on that first possession. So I'm always a proponent of deferring to the half. I think it's better to get the ball at halftime, uh, especially you know, in a maybe a potential tough environment where you're down a score, the last thing you want is a team, you know, beating you by maybe one or two touchdowns, and then they get the ball again uh, to start the second half. So I'm big on a big proponent of just because of the game, you know, everything that's going on around it of, okay, we'll take the ball at halftime, you know, we'll come out of half and we'll potentially have a really good drive, uh, you know, after, you know, a good, some good adjustments at halftime. I think a lot of times you see some good offense, that first possession out of the half, because coaches had all halftime to make their adjustments. And quite frankly, you know, the defensive coordinator just doesn't know what, you know, what wrinkles the offensive coordinator is going to put in until he sees it. So I like deferring to the half. Yeah, I like deferring as well. I, I, I just, no matter what happens, whether it's the first half or the second half, it is still only one possession. It is only the first possession of each half. I like the second half because there are more possibilities by knowing that you have the ball to start the second half. Now, obviously you have to be in a position at the end of the first half to potentially score and kind of double up and all that kind of stuff, but it gives you the chance that no matter what happens at the end of the first half, you can always go, well, we've got the ball to start the second half. You know, it's it's kind of a, you know, like a a, a reset button basically. Part of it does come down to how confident you are in your defense as well. Are you, you know, do, do you want the defense on the field? But part of it also comes down to how confident you are in your offense. I think on the road, I would rather have my defense on the field first in this kind of setting than I would want my offense on the field first, especially for a first time starting quarterback. Now, I've heard some people say, well, get him out there as soon as possible and all those different kind of things. I would just rather put the defense out there first and then know that I have the ball to start the second half, no matter what. Yeah, I completely agree. The Vegas line this evening is still 17 and a half points. It continues to grow. What do you think? You know, we talked about it, or I kind of briefly touched on it earlier. I, th I think it's pretty outrageous, to be honest with you. Um, you know, I, I realize that there's – a lot going into this game. Ohio State is arguably one of the best offenses in the country. Um, I, you know, I know they have the question marks on defense, which is what Notre Dame needs to take advantage of. Put it like this: If Notre Dame doesn't turn the ball over, right, and they establish their run game, there's no reason why they should lose by more than ten points, in my opinion. So I, I think the line is kind of crazy. Me, myself, and I, I think I would be more <laughs> setting it at like minus nine and a half 
or maybe minus like 13 and a half. Um, but yeah, I, I just think Notre Dame has such a, a good game plan and they know that they need to control the ball. They know what they need to do offensively. Um, so yeah, I, I just think that this game, unless there's a lot of turnovers, won't really get out of hand and we won't see, you know, a, a potential 17 to 21 or more loss. But, and again, that's, you know, that going back to what we were talking earlier with Tyler Buckner, that is a question in this game. Right. His accuracy, his decision making, talked about it a lot before. What happens on third down, those kind of things. Is that where he can be forced to make a mistake? Can you rattle him? Will he keep his composure? All those different things. The thing with with Vegas, of course, in these point spreads mm -hmm. is you know, this has gone up by like what two, two and a half points in the last week because the money is all going on the over. So the line keeps going up now at this point. So, you know, so they're 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 obviously taking a lot of money on this. So it's up to 17 and a half now. Marcus Freeman uh, told Holly Rowe from ESPN, I saw this this afternoon. He said at his press conference yesterday, "Hey, I'm going to have to mention that to my team." He said he mentioned it to the team, but he said it wasn't about motivating them for the game necessarily. It was because he wanted their attention in yesterday's practice. They needed to get off the week with a good practice, get started on the right foot. So he mentioned that to kind of motivate them a little bit, get under their skin a little bit to see if they could bring the intensity for practice yesterday. You know, so you know, I, I don't know, Jess, you know, I, I don't know how much you're you're motivated, like when when your teams have been underdogs and and all that kind of stuff, like. Do you play the respect? Do you play the disrespect card? All that kind of stuff, and and how much that motivates you. But I, you know, I, I just there's a complete faction of people who think 17 and a half points is completely suitable, and it's all because of Notre Dame's past in some of these big games. I just think that season opener with all these new elements for everybody, it's a little bit of an equalizer because no matter what. Ohio State thinks they're preparing for for Tyler Buckner. They're not going to see the same offense that Notre Dame put on the field really at any point last year. Now, you flip that around, Ohio State's got a new defensive coordinator as well, and that's going to look different. So it's like which which one is going to be the bigger factor? I think it's going to – I've just said it all week, and I've said it for a while. I think it will be a much closer game than this 17-and-a-half, 18 points. How would you feel if Notre Dame actually does lose by at least 18? Well, I wouldn't feel good. Um, <laughs> I know immediately I wouldn't feel good either because there would be a lot of Ohio State fans in the near proximity that would, you that know. You'll, that'll be chirping on you pretty quick. Yeah, exactly. Remind me when uh, things, things are going bad. Uh, but – you know, it just kind of depends really how the game unfolds. Is if, if it's a game where they, you know, have a lot of mental errors and beat themselves, but, you know, still look good in those question mark areas, then, yeah, you don't feel as bad. But if things, you know, aren't clicking, we see a lot of turnovers, we see indecisive Buckner or just bad reads and, you know, the defense just looking silly out there, then, yeah, I would feel bad about 18-point loss. So I just think there's different things that can factor in of how you're going to feel about it. Um, but, yeah, I, I think if – if they execute well and don't turn the ball over and, you know, do exactly what their game plan said and still lose by 18, then yeah, it would feel pretty bad. But, you know, if they beat themselves, have a lot of mental errors and, and just do very uncharacteristic, uncharacteristic things, then, uh, then yeah, I, I, I would feel pretty bad about that. <laughs> That's the key. That's the key. You know, is it mistake ridden football? Is it a lot of turnovers? Is, is it all those kind of things? Is it just flat out ugly? You know, that will, that will change your mind and opinion on a lot of things and a lot of people in a hurry if if you see that kind of distressing stuff. Now, again, we've only seen snippets of practice, so we only have so much to base things on. But I just I, I, I feel like there is such a focus that this team has every day at practice. I don't anticipate those kind of things happening. I'm not going to say that they're going to go out there and play perfect football. That's not what I'm saying at all, but I don't expect to see that kind of mistake ridden stuff. So, I mean, you lose by 18 though, after all this, all this off season, all this hope and hype and everything else, I think it takes the sheen off a lot of things. And then all of a sudden 
the next basically two months, everything is okay. How are you going to respond? What's it going to look like by the time November 5th rolls around and you get to Clemson? You know, that's what the whole season's going to be about, you know, leading up to that point. Yeah. You know, fortunately for Ohio State and Notre Dame, best time to lose a game is game one of the season. So, you know, whatever the outcome might be, you just hope that they, you know, use it as a, as a stepping stone and really just get better and be prepared for their other big opponent opponents that will have a lot more uh, gravity on, uh, on their, you know, situation towards the end of the season. Yep. Boy, you can tell the season's getting ready to start. We've got Ohio state fans jumping in the live chat here on the YouTube channel. It's like, why (laughs) spend your time in a, in a Notre Dame chat as an Ohio state friend, like fan, like it's one thing to just hop in and, you know, maybe listen and see what the other side's talking about. But like, you're exerting energy in a Notre Dame chat to specifically get into arguments with Notre Dame fans. A little weird in my opinion, but hey, what do I know? <laughs> I know. I mean, it's almost like Ohio State has Purdue complex or something, you know? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, you know, Purdue fans, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Don't even try to deny it. <laughs> Fill in the blank. Desmond Howard's college football playoff picks. Michigan, Pitt, Baylor, Texas A&M. That's blank. Obnoxiously Desmond Howard. Like, Uh, Michigan, uh, I, I, I don't see them doing what they did last year. You know, Ohio State's better, and I think that they kind of not got lucky, but, you know, kind of got lucky. Pitt, no chance. Baylor, no chance. And there's no way that the SEC representative is going to be Texas A&M. So I don't think any of those four teams are going to make it, to be honest with you. It's like I, I realize guys want to be a little bit different, you know, not not just pick the same as everybody else. But you just you can't even be serious <laughs> with this. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, Desmond Howard just he's a professional analyst, but he still had he just the bias for Michigan at a professional level is just it's bad. Everyone talks about Kirk Herb Street, but like, come on, Desmond Howard's by far the worst of that group of just blatant blinder, you know, bias, in my opinion. Did you watch any of game day the other day? No, but I saw the clip of Lee Corso. Uh well the Corso thing, look. I'm not, you know, the guy has been around for a long time and we all get old. I'm not going to make fun of Lee Corso. You know, we we all get old and, and things start, you know, like (laughs) you just, things start happening. Right. I, I, I at least commend ESPN for, for giving him the opportunity, you know, not just casting him off and, and punting him out into the field someplace. The bigger issue to me that made that show a tough watch was if you're going to let everyone be home, you've got to have a better, you know, because like Herb Street was talking about, oh, we've got a second and a half delay. And it's like guys kept talking over each other, you know, like they didn't know when to talk, you know, all these different things, all those kind of problems. That to me was bigger than the Corso thing. And it's like you're ESPN. You've been doing this for years. You even did some of this stuff at home for years. Like we, you know, like, during the pandemic, when we were doing our radio show and we didn't have video like this where we can see each other, it's like if we had more than two guys on, we would always know, okay, this guy's going to talk first, this guy's going to talk second, this guy's going to talk third. Boom, problem solved. And it solves like everyone trying to go, blah, 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 you know, and answer the question either like waiting or then talking over each other all the time. That made it a lot harder to watch for me than Leap. Lee Corso you know I felt I felt bad for Lee Corso and again you know I I commend him for it you know for at least keeping him in there to some extent I know it's getting tougher for him though every year fill in the blank Jess UNLV's turnover slot machine on the sideline is blank is the next great you know fun thing in college football I really you know there's the turnover chains and the turnover celebrations and all that stuff and I admire it, especially on the defensive side of the ball, because defensive players hardly get the glory and the, you know, the love that the offensive players do. They score all the touchdowns. They make all the crazy big plays and get to have fun with all the celebrations. So I'm all in for all for in favor of finding the new creative and innovative way uh, to celebrate a, you know, a turnover on the sidelines. So I love seeing the the, the slot machine over there. I thought it was fun. Uh, and I, I commend the, the creativity. 
You can have a slot machine on the sideline of a football field, but in college baseball, you can't have a sledgehammer to celebrate, you know, like when a guy is hitting home runs, or you can't have props outside a dugout in college baseball. Now, I I do think it is very unique that it's like you, you get a turnover, and now we're going to run over to the slot machine. It is very Vegas, you know, and it's you know, he is just off the strip out there in Vegas. I, I, very unique. I wonder, do you think they're going to bring it with them? Like, will they haul that thing in here to Notre Dame Stadium when they come in here, do you think? I mean, you know, they haul the entire equipment truck. So I don't, you know, as long as as long as it's not a, a Notre Dame thing where they say, no, you can't bring that slot machine in here. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't see why not. You know, it's kind of yeah. the identity when, at that point. You, you, as long as it, as long as it, something. as long as it fits down that visitor's tunnel, I guess, That's because, right. you know, Purdue's big stupid drum wouldn't fit down the tunnel last year. And everybody threw a fit about that. I've got a feeling that the slot machine is going to fit down down there so I'll, I'll be curious if we see the slot machine when unlv comes in very unique to have a turnover slot machine for yes sure. definitely last question tonight and again i was going to have some audio with this but we had some audio issues for whatever reason chris collinsworth was recently on the ringers press box podcast with brian curtis good podcast if you ever get a chance to listen to it so curtis was talking to him about you know, just being an analyst and the conversation shifted into predicting plays. And Collinsworth was like, he basically said, well, I could predict plays. You know, we all get to go to practice and you see all these things taking place at practice, but I'm not going to take advantage of the information that I get by going to these practices and then go out and predict plays. He's like, oh, you know, I've tried it maybe now and then, but, but that's not going to be my thing. I'm not going to go out there and predict plays and take advantage of the information that I get in practice. Now, I'm paraphrasing, of course. Do you feel like he's throwing a little bit of shade there, though? With, with oh, yeah, it's saying very, that some, very some indirect stuff. shade. And, you know, the new contracts came out and all that stuff. So there's actual numbers attached to people's names and all that fun stuff. But, you know, I get what he's saying. But, you know, it, it's not really so much so predicting the play. It's kind of letting – the viewer or fan know that, you know, this is kind of, you know, look here, this is, this is what you need to expect, or this is the matchup that they're trying to exploit here. And at times, yeah, it gets a little bit too much, but I, <laughs> you go to practice, but it's not like, you know, the entire, the entire playbook, right? It's, he's not going to memorize all those things at one time. So it, it, it's, it just doesn't come from one practice. It knows, it comes from knowing the game, studying the game, you know, someone who, who played, uh, you know, we're obviously you know he's talking about Romo, talking about a guy, a quarterback that knows how to read coverages. And, you know, that's really what it is, is a lot of pre-coverage read that I think Romo will go through naturally as a quarterback and not so much more. So, you know, kind of predicting plays of just recognizing what the coverage is and then knowing what the offense is going to try to accomplish based off of that look. So, yeah. And that's the shade was obviously felt like it was at Romo. He never said Tony Romo. You know, they never talked about Tony Romo, but Tony Romo is the one who's become famous for predicting plays, even though he hasn't really done it for the last couple of years. He did it much more that first year, his first couple of years. And I I found it kind of exciting, especially as excited as he would get. He's like, oh, Jim, look up here. You know, if this happens, this is going to yeah. happen and all that different kind of stuff. You know, I thought it was a lot of fun. And like Brent Musburger and some other people were initially going, oh, Romo, he just came off the field. Just wait till he's out of the game for a few years. You know, and he, and he – he doesn't recognize it as well because the game's going to change and all these different things. And now you got Collinsworth basically saying, well, we all go to practice. You can see these things in practice. And so if you're paying attention, we could all do that, basically. <laughs> okay. Right. All right. If you could all do it, then everyone would do I, it. I think what you said is exactly it. You're, you're talking about a quarterback versus a wide receiver one. Now, I'm not saying that Chris Collinsworth can't study film and, and see things, but a quarterback quarterbacks are much – more well versed. I mean, that's like Collinsworth is a great analyst, but most of the top analysts are quarterbacks because of the fact they see the whole field and just what you're talking about, the coverage they see and everything else. So I like it. I felt like it was some serious shade being thrown Same. at Romo, but Chris is getting a big fat paycheck as well. And he's still at NBC. So kumbaya, exactly. just everybody. Everybody get along. And he got and his son a job, too. So, everyone enjoy their coins. I guess I can't talk about 
nepotism, right? Since, <laughs> since you're making all that bank sitting across from me right now. Yeah, okay. <laughs> all right, great stuff again tonight with all the breakdowns. Jesse, we've got the mailbag, the midweek mailbag coming up on tomorrow's show. Vince will be back for that, so we'll answer tons of questions in the midweek mailbag tomorrow. And then coming up Wednesday, we will have the uh, opposing beat reporter from Ohio State to give us his take on the Buckeyes and rapid fire as well. Saturday countdown, IB countdown to kickoff starts at 10 o'clock Saturday morning as we lead up to Notre Dame and Ohio State. There'll be a post-game show after the game. There'll be a show Sunday. So just tons of shows every day, two shows a day, seven days a week, off and running, especially now that the football season is here. If you're an Ohio State fan, get that Purdue complex off you. <laughs> Have a good weekend or a good Thank rest you. of your week. Talk to you tomorrow. We've got uh, more, of course, on IB Nation Sports Talk.